Yeah, then our next speaker is uh, Dr. Bo Qing Gong. So he's a research scientist at Google, Google Seattle and a remote principal investigator at ICSI Berkeley. His research in machine learning and computer vision focuses on modeling, algorithms, and visual recognition. Uh, before joining Google in, 19, uh, in 2019, he worked in Tencent and was a tenure track assistant professor at the University of Central Florida. And he received his PhD in 2015 at the University of Southern California. So uh, his, the talk title is um, uh, Towards Visual Recognition in the Wild, uh, Long-Tailed Sources and Open uh, Compound Targets. So let's welcome uh, Bo, uh, Bo Qing Gong for his talk. Thank you. Thank you, Xinyin, for the introduction. And thank all the organizers for having me here. Uh, I also want to say hi to all the old friends and new friends in this workshop. It's great to see you. Um, OK, yeah, so I'm in Google Seattle. Um, it's too bad that this year, CVPRS, which is, was supposed to, to be here in Seattle, but uh, it cannot uh, come here. So here, I want to show you one picture I, I took last year. That's a beautiful view. Um, so in the future, if you come to Seattle, welcome to drop me an email. I would more than happy to host you uh, in Google. So my talk will be um, mostly two parts. Um, so long-tailed sources and open compound targets. So before reaching uh, what I mean by those, I want to start it with uh, this paper. Uh, it's about uh, object recognition uh, published about 11 years ago now. Um, so at that time, I was actually still a, a junior graduate student. I tried to um, decide uh, what I want to study in the graduate school. Um, so in computer vision, you can go with like a low level vision, um, like a computer vision plus computer graphics, uh, that path. You can also go with the computer vision plus machine learning, this path. I read this paper, it became one of my favorite paper at that moment. So it has a nice um, um, graphing model here uh, to show then how to use attributes to recognize objects, even if you haven't seen them before. Um, I have about 50 classes in their paper. I really love this combination, very neat combination between machine learning and a, a computer vision. So I started to apply to graduate school and started to do a PhD in machine learning. Uh, I worked on domain adaptation. So you have basically uh, different type of data, different type of distribution. Uh, and the goal is always to get a good um, performance uh, for your model on the target domain. At that time, of course, um, all the techniques mostly are on kernel methods before deep learning. And experiments I still use computer vision uh, models and computer vision data sites. Uh, we play with sometimes about 100 classes and we are pretty happy with that. Um, I, I published one paper in 3PR, but all the others are on, on Eurips, SML, on the machine learning conferences. Well, I was partially um, being away from the community. Actually, there's a lot of fantastic things happening. Um, like uh, one, of course, is the ImageNet challenge. Right now, we can, uh, let me try to get the pointer. We can get even superhuman performance here, and you can see. Um, and also, we have a lot of classes, about 1,000 classes. Um, this is kind of like the Pandora box, uh, in a good sense, in a good sense. And to me, this paper opened this Pandora box, because I was working on, on a lot of uh, computer vision data sets. And this, what this paper showed is that even if you do not apply the neural networks, even if you only use deep features, you can already beat all the existing um, state of art uh, results at that moment. This is the paper in 2014. And of course, very quickly, people started to do the fine tuning or transfer learning from ImageNet to all different uh, computer vision tasks. Okay, so uh, also it's about and then time I graduated from my PhD program, become an independent PI. So I wondered, it's time actually to don't indulge myself or my students um, in like just uh, uh, the, the, the established data sets in the community. Don't be happy with only like hundred of classes. Let's go wild. Let's see, okay, so we got a really unprecedented performance in a lot of data sets, what we can do uh, in the wild. 
uh, one of the most, to me, I feel one of the most um, um, kind of challenging data sets, which really well represents the um, real world is, is the iNaturalist data set. It's a data set collected by Google uh, together in partnership with uh, an institute in California. Uh, they have a lot of uh, biologic scientists and they contributed a lot of data in the world. Also for every single image, they have annotations, not from the crowdsourcing uh, uh, kind of like AWS workers, but actually by scientists. Um, also, there are a lot of classes. So we started to look into this data set. And very interestingly, um, because the data is from the world, from the real world, uh, you have a very long tail distribution over the classes. Some of the classes actually have only five or 10 training images, but the others you really got up to more than 1000 training images. So how can we still apply uh, previously successful machine learning techniques uh, in the standard manually compiled data sets to this is uh, a little bit more wild uh, data set. That's become the problem. And we tried different techniques and then this long tail distribution, however, is always kind of like the challenge there. Then we started to look around to see whether this phenomena is uh, only unique by this data set or actually it's um, let me try to move this. It's popular in other data sets in the world. The answer is, is yes. If you go to the real world data sets, um, some data sets I mean that it's not manually compiled, manually uh, pruned, you always have this long tail distribution. So here I give you four or more examples. Uh, this one is from the scene understanding data set. So it's compiled for scene understanding, it's balanced across different, uh, different places, different scenes. However, if we check the objects in this data set, they are long-tailed because we never tried to manually tune the distribution of the objects. Second example is Flickr. If you check the Flickr tags, they also follow a long-tailed distribution. Um, this is a landmark recognition data set and you can see we got a lot of training images from North America, from Europe and East Asia, but the other areas of the globe is unfortunate that we, we don't have a lot of training data. Uh, probably you are more familiar, I think the audience in this workshop, more familiar with this one, it's called a, um, a large scale instance segmentation data set from Facebook. Um, also, it has a long tail distribution. Um, okay, so Given all of those, I hope I have already convinced you. I hope you are with me, with me that uh, it's not something that um, th this long tail challenge in visual recognition, it's not one particular phenomena for one data set or one task. It's really there for all different tasks and the data sets in computer vision. In the future, if we really want to push the boundary of visual recognition further, we have to deal with this challenge. So we therefore formalized this problem in 2018. Of course, the paper came out in 2019. So in 2018, we felt it's the time to actually formalize this problem uh, to become an independent research problem we want to study. So previously they have appeared in some papers as a, like a small section or some modules in, in some of their approaches, we feel okay, it's actually time to make it independent and we should try to study it, uh, try to solve this problem by formalizing a research problem. So we uh, compiled three uh, long-tailed uh, distribution di data sets with long-tailed distribution over uh, classes. So here about 1000 classes, here about 3000 classes, we also got a phase data set. Um, okay, so the idea is uh, don't want to go really with lots of classes um, because otherwise maybe some um, um, you know research labs might be struggling to play with the data set. So we try to find a balance between um, the scale and the long tail distribution. Hopefully that researchers from um, academia and industry they can all uh, work on this um, problem. Also we got a, a I think straightforward um, 
a neural architecture at that moment, which is to use the memory bank to enhance the uh, tail classes. So we got a good results. And then um, I joined Google. We started to kind of like argue uh, with one of um, my great colleagues, Matthew Brown, regarding what's the difference between this long-tailed um, recognition and the traditional imbalanced classification. Uh, then we can sort of concluded that these two are kind of like interesting um, uh, mix of, of the old AI and the new AI. By the old AI, I mean uh, the imbalanced classification. The people we have been working on this problem even before the deep learning for a long time in different uh, communities, in machine learning, computer vision, data mining. But now, because of the tail, we really actually got a few short learning problem for the tail classes. And if you check the existing approaches to few short learning, we got a meta learning, we got a transfer learning, a zero shot learning. So different techniques. So this problem, uh, th this long tail recognition problem is really a natural blender or mix of these two different problems. So hopefully therefore we can also um, motivate a lot of new techniques as well. Uh, then it's a little bit unfortunate because if we check the recent publications, they all reported very good results, but they mostly try to uh, weigh different classes. Um, so the class or the instance weighting is, is really uh, kind of like a, the cornerstone in domain adaptation. So I therefore went back to um, the old equations in domain adaptation, which I studied uh, during my PhD uh, program, and uh, tried to understand this long tail recognition from a domain adaptation perspective. So we got a long tail training set. Of course, the tail here is over classes. Um, but we don't want the model to be unbiased. We, we want the model to be high quality, high performing, actually over all classes. So in other words, we, we expect a balanced or roughly balanced uh, um, uh, testing set for the model. If we formalize this problem a little bit more carefully, so, and you can see the equation here, of course, still, and I said earlier, are uh, very, um, cornerstone, but a very old equations in domain adaptation. Um, so, so nothing fancy. So you can see here, we want to have good performance on the target. In the long tail recognition scenario, we want the model to perform well on all classes. So this target therefore is unbiased over classes. We don't know the testing data, of course. We can change the distribution by the, by the trick in important sampling. So we sample instead from the long tail source domain. And of course, you need a weight here. If we decompose them into a marginal over a class, uh, here PS is the source, we know it's long tailed. PTY is the target, we know we expect it to be uh, roughly balanced because we don't want the model to be biased to any of the classes. We want, to, want it to perform well over all classes. So we use a roughly balanced uh, testing set to test the model. Also, we got a conditional distributions here. And further, we wrote them into um, um, some, um, some omega y and one plus this for this part. And you can see, by trying to weigh different terms in the training over classes, these approaches, they are effectively assuming that is epsilon is zero. In other words, let me show this figure, maybe it's, it's more clear. In other words, they are assuming that the two conditional distributions between the source and the target actually are the same. Uh, I don't think that's the case. Let's try to study these two distributions a little bit more carefully. So in the head classes, given a class cat, the conditional distribution probably can be well represented by a lot of training images because you have a lot of training images in a um, training set, maybe it's okay. But for the tail classes, given a class tag, for example, uh, it's really hard to get enough training images to well represent this tail class. So it's really hard, therefore, to assume these two are the same. Um, so we tried, therefore, challenge the existing assumptions in the existing works. 
and we formalize them into uh, um, some, I think, very straightforward equations in the paper. It's well received in the community. And we try to argue that the long-tail recognition actually can be understood from the domain adaptation perspective. Of course, in the paper, we also tried to estimate not only the class-wide weights, but also the weights for every example, so the epsilon. By a meta learning approach, so naturally connecting the um, kind of old, old AI problem, estimating, estimating class-wide weights, and the new AI problem, which is to uh, use meta learning to improve the future of learning scenario. We got state art results on six data sets. I will skip the results. Um, instead, I want to emphasize by this slide that um, by understanding this problem from the domain adaptation perspective, it's really, I hope, is really helpful for the future work because domain adaptation, it has uh, been there for many, many years. And we have some very successful techniques, uh, maybe not successful, you can call it at least popular, <laughs> popular techniques, like learning domain environment features, curriculum learning, adversarial training, uh, class discrepancy, a lot of data synthesize and the data augmentation techniques. So we hope these can benefit uh, the future work to the long tail of the visual recognition. Okay, uh, okay, I will skip this. So that's one challenge when we tried to um, extend the visual recognition to the real world. Um, and Meanwhile, I want to touch on the second aspect, which is the uh, adversarial uh, attack and adversarial defense. I honest with all the audience in the, this workshop, I feel um, the adversarial kind of um, robustness is definitely what we need, but probably it's not there yet because um, adversarial attack, uh, maybe it's a real risk for the visual recognition models, maybe not, we don't know yet. But at least we try to build up some robust models uh, to prepare for the worst case. Uh, but of course, in order to do the visual uh, recognition model, which is robust, we need to know uh, the strong, strong attack in order to do the defense, right? So in 2018, this paper came out. Uh, they tried to see that, okay, all the existing defense models are not really, really not good enough. So they can break those models, set these different defense models by white box attack. So it's very natural therefore to ask, what about black box attack? Could you, uh, could you actually successfully break the state of the art defense models by some black box um, attack algorithms? And then time I was working on reinforcement learning. So it's very natural therefore to consider black box as kind of like a, an environment. Uh, we don't know the gradients. We cannot pass the gradients through that blank box um, neural network. But we do know in reinforcement learning, policy gradient descent, it's, it's very natural solution to that issue, right? So we tried to apply this um, policy gradient descent basically to this blank box attack. Uh, we consider this as the environment and our policy is the distribution over the adversarial examples. So more concretely, Given an input here, uh, we try to impose a um, policy distribution over this um, input, such that the policy will try to propose an um, adversarial example. So in other words, if these are the adversarial examples, they will have really high density in the distribution uh, or in the policy here, perhaps. So, so it's very straightforward actually to learn this path. We want to uh, maximize the cross entropy loss. Basically the traditional classification loss, we try to minimize it to learn the neural, neural network. Now instead we want to fool the neural network. Therefore we try to maximize the network with respect to this policy, uh, which is the distribution, right? Uh, I give you a little bit more detail here, how we specify uh, this distribution. It started with a Gaussian. Uh, similar to the traditional generative models like a vari variational encoder or uh, some uh, uh, generative adversarial networks. Therefore, that's why also we name this, this attack algorithm as Gaussian attack. Uh, the results are surprising. <laughs> it's, it's, it's better than we expected. 
We tested about 13 state-of-the-art defense algorithms uh, published at that time on both ImageNet and CFOTEN. And you can see we really got a very good um, success rate. So we can successfully attack almost all of them, except some other um, strong, uh, some of the models of course are very strong. So we can partially hear about 40% of the uh, success rate, but still very good. Uh, you don't want to deploy a model which has only 40% accuracy in the real world. Um, okay, so it's also, uh, yeah, for the, for the time being, I want to speed up a little bit. Um, please um, try to, um, yeah, uh, be with me. Uh, it's also because of the reinforcement learning I was working on at that moment. So one of my uh, former students, uh, Yang Zhang, he got uh, very familiar with the uh, simulators. Then we tried to do something with the simulators. Therefore, uh, can we actually try to generate some physical camouflage to, to hide some vehicles from neural detectors? And you can see here, when the color changes, it means uh, we failed the neural network a little bit. So it, the answer, therefore, is yes. Um, after indulging ourselves on the attack side, we really don't want to work on the attack side anymore. I, I think we have a common sense in this community. It's way easier to do attack uh, than doing defense. Therefore, let's try to do the hard problem now. So it was perfect timing when we started to consider this problem because I uh, moved to Google and Han, one of our organizers also moved to Google. Um, we also got a lot of nice infra inside Google. So naturally, we started to think, can we try to build a robust neural network by neural architecture search? So all the existing models, neural network, we know they are not very robust. Um, can we therefore try to design a new search space, maybe try to search a different neural network? Um, maybe it will be more robust than the existing neural networks. We started to work on this, and it's, it's really, really great. So he successfully published not, on, not one, but two um, very good high quality publications. This is one in 3 pr 20 and another one we submitted to New Rips. So I will actually have to skip this one because it's under submission and review. Um, but the whole idea is to do the search uh, by a little bit uh, neural architecture search. Um, and plus a little bit manual, manual tuning to get a more robust uh, neural network. Okay. So these two, the long tail distribution and the adversarial attack and defense are uh, maybe two um, challenges we can identify when we try to uh, use machine learning models, a uh, computer vision, a uh, visual recognition model in the wild. The very last one is, is domain adaptation. So it's always the case that I want to extend the visual recognition model to the wild. See, okay, if we do that, what are the main challenges? Then we come back to the research lab or to the um, uh, company, then started to work on that. So the very last aspect I want to share with you is domain adaptation in, uh, I will try to ramp it up in um, two minutes. Okay, so let me use self-driving as an example. Um, almost all self-driving companies, they have their own simulator. Here, simulator is not necessarily the, the computer graphics. They could be real scenario. They can, for example, buy a large area and then they drive the car on that area, in that area. And then they can try to simulate all different physical scenarios in that um, uh, area, right? So they try to get all the possible scenarios on a testing stage, like a different weather conditions here. But no matter what they do, I hope you agree with me. Uh, there are some cases, some scenarios that the training side really cannot cover. Not only that case, it's also that even if they cover all the scenarios in their training set, maybe they do not have uh, enough training set, training data to well represent uh, some of the domains here, some of the weather conditions. Therefore, we tried to formalize this scenario into a research problem. We call it an open compound domain adaptation. The setup is the following. So we have a large scale training set we tried to cover a rare, really a variety of scenarios. 
And meanwhile, we got some uh, unable data from a lot of um, uh, different scenarios. We don't know which, from which scenario those testing data are from, those unable data are from, but we do know they have a very different and heterogeneous uh, testing scenarios. We call them domains. And in testing stage, however, we want to test the model on all the scenarios, not only in the training stage uh, scenarios of the training set, also the domains of the compound here in target domain, as well as some open domain, which means we do not have any data, no matter labeled or unlabeled from this domain, but we, we want the model to perform well on this domain. So given time, I will only introduce this problem to you and I have to uh, actually skip this um, technique. You can try to reach out to me after this talk. Instead, let me try to summarize. Um, so I like the research methodology that um, we try to not only actually work on the well-established data sets in the community, but also try to think of what happens if we want to apply what we have in the community to the real world. We got all different challenges, like a long tail distribution, like a domain adaptation, like the adversarial uh, attack. So after identifying those challenges, we can come back to the research lab and then try to formalize those challenges into research problems. Um, the long tail recognition, we could use uh, a memory bank to enhance the tail classes. And by understanding this problem from domain adaptation, I hope you agree that actually we could benefit from the really rich set of techniques in domain adaptation to develop better models for the long tail recognition. Of course, also I want to share that the long tail training set is a nice mix of the uh, old AI, which is the uh, imbalanced classification, and the new AI, which is the few shot of meta learning problems. How to mix these two, how to develop better advanced techniques from these two different um, um, areas would be also very interesting. Uh, domain adaptation, um, okay, I will skip this. It's, it's a really rich uh, subfield as well. Um, I want to, yes, so end this talk by this page. We do want to get good models. Uh, I will probably not work on attack anymore. <laughs> Instead, I will try to work on defense. So all the existing approaches, they try to do like a data augmentation. I consider adversary training as also a type of data augmentation as well, or data cleaning, or randomization, quantization of the networks, uh, including weights and activations. Um, those are all good. What's missing is the architecture. Actually, we already know existing architectures are not robust. Can we try to do like a, some Lipschitz continuous network or large margin networks? We know they are certified robust, but can we improve their accuracy? Or can we use some existing other modules, try to build up memory banks or stateful modules or denoising modules into the network to improve their robustness? Those are all good questions I think to need to be answered. I would be more than happy to see if in the field we can come up with some uh, solutions in the future. So I will stop here. Uh, thank you so much. We can discuss more in the panel discussion.